welcome to the waiting list podcast tell us the story it's like many things you start building from from scratch and then i'm like wait i really do like watches because you, you've seen so many watches that makes you excited yeah, i think i really really do like watches. yeah 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 i think it's a great way to see if you are a watch enthusiast right so we're gonna start well today i'm very uh, happy to interview my good friend who's uh, based in Hong Kong. He supported the Shanghai Watch Festival. He actually flew all the way up to Shanghai on literally a week or two notice. So I thought that was amazing. And actually we do share an even stronger commonality, which is that we're actually born in the same hospital, not in the same year, <laughs> but the same hospital. Right, so it's my friend Alex Lau. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Long Long. Welcome. Um, so we want to start off, since most of our listeners probably don't know who you are, can you give us a brief, uh, brief background of what you do in Hong Kong? Sure. So, um, th well, thanks for having me on here again. So I'm kind of doing uh, private wealth management. So I'm involved with helping and managing people's and my clients' wealth. And I'm also kind of involved with certain other business opportunities as well, knowing that every one of my clients you know, have different you know, topics and subjects and things that they go into and investing wise. Uh, my job is to meet as many people as possible to kind of spread what they do as well. So that's kind of what I mainly do. Okay, so are you is it are you at liberty to say like, is there an entry barrier to work with Alex Lau? <laughs> well, the answer is no. So <laughs> All right. anyone can be my client. Okay, so I mean, I got I'm not going to be that difficult no i got a, i got a chance then <laughs> <laughs> of course you can always always even you give me a dollar i'll still look after you <laughs> right so what made you come to hong kong because you're not originally from hong kong no, which we'll come across we'll come to but what made you come to hong kong um so i think when it was um i graduated in 2011 and it was after the recession there wasn't really much jobs going around and it was actually because of my grandmother wanted to come back to hong kong and since i had didn't have any sort of ties in the uk i thought you know what Let's take a risk, come to Hong Kong and see what I can do here. Um, and then basically it was just pure luck. I was studying accounting. Then I went to Hong Kong. Whilst I was looking for jobs in accounting, I saw the pay and I thought, it's not good enough. <laughs> so yeah. it was kind of like purely by luck, I kind of stumbled ac across this you know, private wealth management gig and kind of took the opportunity here. Really liked the team, really liked the boss. And I just thought I'd give it a go. Okay, that's cool. But that's actually... In very stark contrast to actually where you come from yeah. in the UK you like you know your childhood and everything and I actually personally find that a very powerful story okay so if it's possible I, I want you're someone that I think people would listen to and it would give them the motivation to do it because you've made it from nothing right too kind but... and I <laughs> you know you've got a certain level and obviously we're still humble because there's many people that are way wealthier than you but i think you've done pretty good man man too kind too kind yeah. so i yeah. mean um like, i'll share with uh, a little bit of story because actually daniel and i went through the same sort of thing am i allowed to say that yeah of course you can <laughs> so um so, yeah, i think I, I, gotta, <laughs> I gotta say i i think you went through it like at least 10 times worse than me <laughs> <laughs> i'll try and dilute it then so i won't make it too contrast um so yeah i mean my father had two takeaways in the restaurant um, and I was unfortunately managing one of them. So I remember when I was you know, 13, 14, I used to go to school, come home, then work, start work at five, finish at 11, go to sleep and start the routine again. And um, my dad worked seven days a week. So realistically, my only day off was like a Monday because like the weekends were always going to be busy. Mm -hmm. So the only time I wanted some time off was really half a day on Monday because I still had school. So, <laughs> and I did that all the way to university. Then I kind of... Um, chose a university which was closer to one of my uncles um which i was quite close with and um my dad gave me a call back and says i need you back on the weekend so i ended up having to come all the way back on the weekend on friday saturday to really help the store out then come back and do my university studies so i did the typical asian thing where mm -hmm. we were doing like slave labor, <laughs> <laughs> Child yeah, labor. Yeah. but the, but the yeah. worst part the worst part was actually cleaning the extractor fans as daniel would recall he never had to do that Explain but this. i had to suffer I can't, I, I can't really yeah. recall because i never yeah. actually did it <laughs> so um i used to see people yeah. do it and yeah, i thought that is a shit job, <laughs> right? I, I just yeah. saw it, like, 
Okay, you didn't have um, fish and chips no, in your place, right? No. And you know the fish where the fish is. There's obviously a lot of oil there. There is that yeah. whole area needs to be clean. And you know, if, I'm sure everybody knows oil and water doesn't mix very well. <laughs> so how is it done for people? Like, well, I know nothing about That's a it. Fucking <laughs> nightmare. Yeah, like, do you have to climb up there? Like, well, well this is a watch podcast. I'm not going to talk about cleaning. <laughs> like, <laughs> lot. I, I start, yeah. So how yeah. I would normally do it is actually like, I've spoken to Daniel before. Yeah. The secret is actually very expensive cleaning products and the boiling hot water basically <laughs> very liquid <laughs> boiling hot water and some uh, cleaning products All right. and basically you sp- you have to basically use half a bottle each time you do it and then um, very liquid hot water get rid of as much oil as possible then you get a new clean bucket yeah. and then that's where you polish it again so it's kind of like an hour and a half of just suffering basically and you got to do this every day well yeah it was it was staggered so it's like every three four days okay depending on time wise okay Okay, so what you're saying is you went to school and you went to work pretty much six and a half days, no rest. Did you have any time to like meet up with your friends? Uh, Not really, if I was honest, Um, which was, I don't know what it was. I mean, um, I think because I saw my father working all the time. So for me, it was like, okay, that's how I should be like Mm -hmm. surviving, right? Um, But when I did feel very uncomfortable was actually when... um, like I missed out on a lot of things, basically. So, for example, when friends were going out clubbing or, you know, yeah. when they go play football. Because yeah. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I didn't really have that chance when they were doing some sort of parties and gatherings. But it was always like, no, I have to kind of work on my future. Because mm-hmm. a side story was um, my father is actually was you know, separated from my mother mm-hmm. when I was like one. So I'm not living with my stepmother. So I wasn't actually living the life or having that kind of accommodation that mm-hmm. one would normally get so for me i had to kind of work my way up myself so it's a bit like uh cinderella uh exactly maybe i don't know well, i mean I, i'm i'm guess not but i mean like it's kind of now nah, you have to work your way up and i think that's what life's all about and on the way you meet some great people so friends at school and some customers that you get to interact with mm-hmm. i did kind of enjoy it to be fair so even though it was tough there are moments which, you know, I'm glad I actually went through it. Um, what was it like living with your stepmother? Yeah, it was uncomfortable. <laughs> it was yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah, it was. So it was. I find that like so it's not something I can relate to because I've never had that. But it just right. sounds like such a tough childhood. You're basically doing an adult's job because yeah. right? yeah. you were also running that store. You weren't just working no, in that. You were yeah. running it, right? Yeah. Uh, then the funny thing was, yeah. I'm sorry to cut you up, apologize, but um, it was when the recession happened that mm-hmm. two of the uh, stores didn't do so well, yeah. but the one I was managing was actually still open. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, that's the one that my father, they're not going back to work. I was like, well, I managed that one well, so, um, so that was quite good. How, how did you feel when you saw like, because I know I felt this, right? Because I didn't, wasn't putting the arrows you were, but I thought it was really unfair. Like you had all your, because you you brought up in England. You don't know anything kind of different, right? Obviously, you know your Chinese as well. And you see a lot of the Caucasian kids uh, running around doing, like, basically having that freedom, right? Did you not think, oh, man, this is so unfair? And especially when it got to teenage years where you wanted to do all that stuff. I, I found that incredibly difficult. Like, I was like, why can't I do this stuff that they're doing? Um, I think I was, uh, that was a great question. I, I think I was very highly influenced by, there's a show called Dragon's Den, mm. right? So you've got these bunch of investors. It was like Peter Jones, which is pretty cool. James Kahn, yeah. uh, Theopathetus. So these guys um, were basically listening to investment and they're investing in them. Mm-hmm. And I think I was really like, okay, I want to be like one of them one day. You know, so I want to be yeah. like, how do I make money? You know, yeah. how do I, and majority of the time they always say some stuff like working hard and trying to kind of, um, do what you have to do so mm-hmm. you can do what you want to do and it was kind of like with those sort of things impregnated in my mind basically I just stuck with it and I thought well there's not much point complaining just get on with it and do it mm-hmm. so if that's the life I've been given or that's what's in front of me well do that because I'm sure there's some sort of benefit I mean there must be some sort of benefit to working hard and being in that environment and like speaking to clients so you never lost hope so yeah maybe it was it was never yeah may, I think so I think so because you know a lot of BBCs. I know a I lot do. of BBCs, yeah. right? Not all BBCs are the same. No, they're not. Right. <laughs> Far from can, yeah. can you explain this? Okay, so yeah. because we're like mixed culture, yeah. right? We have that 
uh, you could say like the English side、yeah. and the Chinese side. Okay. So it's literally like you could imagine zero to a hundred percent. My family is quite traditional, so the way I was brought up was when I was at home,、mm-hmm. I had to speak Chinese. I had to speak Cantonese. Okay. Right. I also、yeah. went to a Chinese school every Sunday,、mm-hmm. and my dad taught、mm-hmm. me Chinese every other evening. So after I came、mm-hmm. back.、Mm-hmm. Actually, did a, he did loads of things like、yeah. that? You know, I had to、yeah. play the piano,、yeah. typical Asian kid. Then I had to read the newspaper, yeah, right, yeah. and then I had to do my Chinese, right.、Um, so that I would say,、uh, if I'm most comfortable with, is yes, mixed culture. But I'm seventy percent to eighty, I reckon, mentally Chinese.、Mm-hmm. Obviously, I can work the. Western European way because、mm-hmm. I know what it's about,、yeah. but that's not like my true self.、Mm-hmm. Obviously, then you have BBCs that don't even recognize that they're Chinese, so、yeah. they'll think that they're actually English. Yeah, and I actually thought that was like the dumbest thing ever. Yeah, because if you went down the street in England, pick any street, not、mm-hmm. even the racist ones,、mm-hmm. right? And you went to the first English guy, person, and said, "Hey, bro, am I English、yeah. or am I Chinese?" Guess what he's gonna fucking say? <laughs> he's gonna say you're Chinese, you idiot. <laughs> what a dumb like, question! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, yeah. so for for you to think that you're a Caucasian person, when that country doesn't even recognize、mm-hmm. you as a Caucasian person, I think is like a bit of self denial. Having said that, I understand if certain BBCs have never had that exposure,、mm-hmm. they never had the chance to connect with that culture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I understand that too. It's just that I don't necessarily bond, and it was actually a big problem for me because I don't want to take over this interview. No, no, no. But, you should, you, you, but、um, please, you know, when you're growing up, right, there weren't many BBCs like me, and if there is a BBC, it doesn't mean I'm automatically a friend with you because you're a BBC, right?、Mm-hmm. But then the internet came. There was like ICQ, MSN、mm-hmm. Messenger,、mm-hmm. and I live very close to London, which is a hub of Chinese people at the time, right? So I just met people that were similar background from me, and I used to just sneak down in Chinatown all the time, and I started identifying with. It really helped me to find my、wow. identity.、Mm-hmm. It was a big problem for me. Wow. Yeah, because I just didn't know who I was. I'm actually really curious about something. So. Because I only spend most of my time in London, yeah. And then you see all the fancy stuff like the shopping centers and everything, right? Yeah. But um, if you grow up in a small town, right? Yeah. I don't understand where you get your drive from because you don't see this stuff. You only see it on TV.、Yeah. So when you see these really successful people on TV, you're yeah. like, yeah, this is just too far away from me. Like it's never gonna happen to me.、Yeah. So how do you develop that that drive?、Uh, uh, Well, that's you a, go first, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Know, you. Yeah, you、um, might take on that. That's a great question.、Um, I guess I, you know, always had this sort of ambition to do well in life. I mean, because you know, apart from watches, actually, I started off really having a passion for cars.、Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it was like, okay, how much is this car? It's a hundred thousand pounds or two hundred thousand pounds for those specific types. And I thought, right. I need to do some math here to work out how I need to get there.、Mm-hmm. So for me, you can call it materialistic, but when I was young,、mm-hmm. like early teens, I really wanted to have that sort of ambition to achieve something. So for me, it was kind of like regardless of、um, where I am or what I'm doing, just kind of work hard and just see where life takes you. And I've always thought that it was after university where I really make the money. So from then to university, as long as I do what I'm meant to, I, as long as I discipline myself,、mm-hmm. and I think all things will take care of itself. And I think actually it's because I didn't have a choice. Is if you had a choice to kind of be lazy or you know your parents subside、mm-hmm. subsidize for you for everything,、yeah. you can just be at home and just play video games and go、yeah. out with your friends. You don't develop that sort of character, character、yeah. and yeah. kind of like that resilience. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. for me, because I was forced in that situation, well, I just stuck with it, and I didn't just stick with it. I actually, did a pretty good job, I think.、Yeah. So I mean, like、yeah. I thought I, I handled it quite well. Didn't really get too stressed majority of the time, and I thought I can. Ha- I mean. To be fair, if no one knows how to, who's you know, no one's ever worked in a restaurant business before.、Mm-hmm. Go work in a restaurant business, and you realize how shit it is. <laughs> it's how, yeah, how hard tough, work. How much? How, how、mm-hmm. it's、work. kind of like. I mean, I, I'm you know, I'm quite happy we're doing this podcast, but people don't realize what's going on behind the scenes.、Mm-hmm. When they make a phone call and they just place an order, the food doesn't you know pop out from thin air. <laughs> it has to be people who actually have to cook and work in like tremendous heat and. 
that's be like a logistic structure with delivering mm -hmm. and it's funny because on Saturdays I have so many people complaining it's like why is the food taking so long so I start writing the, the time of when they <laughs> called and they'll call me and say why is my food taking so long I said excuse me sir you've ordered 45 minutes ago and like on a Saturday Sunday 45 minutes is it's not a long thing, time yeah. there's nothing so um and we have to do delivery as well so you know there's time for transportation included so yeah in regards to your first question it was more about you know just sticking with it and not worrying too much mm -hmm. just doing what's necessary because you know you don't have all the things with you you don't understand what success is you don't mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. what life's about you don't understand anything so all you've got to do is just force yourself in that position where you just have to go through it regardless whether you like it or not tell us that story about that customer Oh, so many. Which one? The, the one with the car. Oh, yeah, that one. It's amazing. Okay, so um, this was in 2007. So this individual um, was driving a 911 GT3 RS, 997.1, manual gearbox. And I just, I was cleaning you know, plates and everything because we didn't, we were short of stuff mm -hmm. that day. In your apron. And in and my stuff. apron. No, I wasn't wearing an apron. Because <laughs> oh. like, I just, you know, because you're so busy, you don't have time to take your apron on and off because you're serving customers at the same time you're washing. So sometimes I'm just like, okay, mm -hmm. dart between the two. Then I heard this car kind of like, you know, stop at the front of our house, the, 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 um, the store. So I went out and served him. We started talking. And then uh, was talking about cars. His name is called John, John Oakley. Mm -hmm. um, then having spoken to him, he goes to me, uh, do you want to go for a ride? I was like, I, I was like <laughs> I, I, I'm normally very well behaved. Like yeah. I always stay in the store. I don't do anything. But this time I was like, oh, do you want to screw it? <laughs> and then I sat in the car and he just drove me around. And he was such a cool guy. Mm -hmm. um, went, I'm not going to say how fast we were going, but we went quite fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of gave me the thrill. And then... As soon as he, you know, went back to the store, that was a massive inspiration for me because it, it was kind of like one small step to mm -hmm. where I wanted to be, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, then the second time he came around was when I was actually at university. Um, but since I was at university, I wasn't at the store. So yeah. he came around and said, you know, is Alex here? And the staff lady said, no, he's not. He'd come <clears> back <throat> on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So he went away and on the weekend, he del deliberately came back, mm -hmm. saw me and took me out for a spin again. So what this guy does for a living is he buys these supercars, make them a lot faster and sell them on to sell them on for more money. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been in a 458 Italia of his and the 911 GT3. Mm -hmm. Then the last time he came around was in a Porsche Panamera. Mm -hmm. So he took me around and says to me, oh, what do you think of the Porsche Panamera? And for me, I was like, okay, maybe I was a bit young, but I was quite yeah. rude and said, it's not as good as the GT3 or the, uh, the other cars that you had before. Mm -hmm. um, but he said to me, Cristiano Ronaldo just brought this car. And since I was a massive mm -hmm. fan of Ronaldo, I was like, okay, that's pretty intense. Mm. So I think like that customer or that person alone gave me a lot of inspiration because it kind of gave me like motivation mm -hmm. to kind of pursue things. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. for me, my, my you're like your parents, right? They just worked their ass off, yeah, really but hard. they, but they were actually bosses. I've never seen my parents were in an area where they've not been the boss. Mm -hmm. So all I've seen is that's what bosses do, right? And then we were always like, you never really know really about your family wealth, really. You just, can I get this computer game? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. My parents didn't spoil me at all. Right. So I didn't get any presents. The only presents I got was my birthday and my um, Christmas. Okay. But for my birthday, I only, I only got 40 quid. It's mm -hmm. more than what I got. <laughs> Someone's lucky here. <laughs> 40 pounds. That's all I got, right? But like, you could, couldn't really get anything with that. Right. And then for my Christmas was like the only present, big present I got. Any, anything else? Like, if I saw a toy, no, you don't get it. And why, why did we not get it? Because we don't have money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, I, they did. Yeah. But that's what they told me. So yeah. like, don't. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So I grew up thinking, damn. Meteor is shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get anything I want, right? And then he used to say to me also, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. they, when you got money, you buy it yourself. So I, I grew up thinking like, fuck man, we're just poor as hell mm -hmm. and I need to make money. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, that's really I think good. it's, which actually leads on to my next question. Okay. What do you think, how big an influence do parents play in your success. I know this is very interesting for you because not all your experiences have been positive. No, of course not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's a hard question, you know. Um, 
frankly speaking, the only side I paid attention was actually to my father's side because um, my mother's side, she kind of like was, you know, darting from, you know, small jobs. She was never the boss in certain places. She was always working for people. And then from my father's perspective, I just saw him work hard all the time. So I thought that was a norm. Um, and, but the one thing I would give my father and my mother absolute respect for is they never paid attention to my studies. So I remember when I got my first honors in accounting, I told my mother and she was like, what's that? Is that good or bad? I was like, it's okay. <laughs> I was like, it's not bad. It's all right. Mm. And then my father didn't really have any influence in terms of what I was studying. Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to be an architect. So I did all the courses in regards to doing architecture. Then um, found out that it was seven years mm. afterwards or something like that. And mm. the cost was huge. I thought, no, I don't want to do that. Mm. It wasn't an easier way to make money. Um, someone says accounting is quite good to make money. Did the accounting and realize it doesn't really make much money either. So mm. to me, it was just um, not so much their influence. It was more about, I guess, they just let me be yeah. and they just worked hard. I guess just by seeing what, seeing how hard they worked was good enough as influence for what I was expecting. Yeah. I knew they wasn't intelligent. I just knew that they were hard workers. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit contrasting with me. Right. When it came to like report day, fuck man. <laughs> either got like massive beating <laughs> or I did well you know what How I mean how many bruised like, did you have because the thing is like my parents it, restaurant business blue collar work right yes. like it's hard work mm -hmm. it's manual labor mm -hmm. and my parents wanted so desperately for me not to do that so they were so keen to you're gonna be like professional I think that goes to some way explaining why Chinese parents are the way they are especially uh, abroad mm -hmm. into in these western countries not mm -hmm. like totally out of asia mm -hmm. is because most of those people that left left hong kong right and they they left hong kong because their life was crap right mm -hmm. and they didn't have the education or the resources to do the really good jobs right and it was really tough for them and they really didn't want their kids to go through that and they from what they know is if you got educated you didn't have to do this right mm -hmm. And you don't have to do the hours that other people do. So there's yeah. something that I picked up um, just listening to you and Alex, right? The whole thing with uh, nature versus nurture. So nurturing is obviously parenting, right? Um, I do think just observing the two of you, you have a certain personality trait that makes you so driven, though, because Okay, if you think about it, right, from anyone that does well from being a kid to um, even after you uh, uh, yeah all the way into university right that's easy doing well in life because you are being parented you have a schedule you have to go to classes you're just taking those boxes you don't have the initiative yeah yet. but yeah. you have to learn to parent yourself after you leave uni and that's when you can see when where are people gonna excel right that's and true. do better than other people so to be able to do well after shows that you obviously have this regardless of whether your parents did well or not right you have this kind of like self-discipline self-discipline um competitive streak even oh, yeah. right you have something yeah. in you that's different that's what i just picked no that's up. right no no just... good comment lung yeah i agree with that yeah so since we're talking about success right what is success to you because i'm pretty sure i know you mm -hmm. what you have now isn't success and tell no. us that bit about where you got to a certain level and you're enjoying all of that stuff yeah and you know you know what i'm talking about i know right? what you're talking about yeah, yeah. um okay so I, uh the way i see it i feel like there's a couple of great phrases that always come to mind and the first i always say is for everyone should always aim for the highest possible good so if people say you know they're trying to find meaning in their life or whatever I'll just say, just aim for the highest possible good and do the best of yourself that you can. And that way it kind of moves you towards one place that you want to be. Um, for me, um, I did think success was about the money game. So I'm not going to lie. Um, I was kind of really interested in working hard so that I can live that comfortable life. Um, and for me, when I was 22, when I was working where I was working, I, you shouldn't really talk about money, but I'll just say out now. Um, I was earning like one million Hong Kong dollars was about hundred thousand pounds so for a 21 22 year old mm. it's actually not easy especially from like coming out from nothing right yeah. and i was kind of like coasting so 22 25 i thought wow this is 
okay, this is quite straightforward. Mm. This is how life is. Right? Like, yeah. This is easy. I've made it. So I made, not made it, but it was like, okay, it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be, right? Then, um, of course, my income kept going up because I was working a lot harder. Mm-hmm. Um, but in between, it was more about, no, this, this isn't right. You know, I, of course, I really enjoyed what I was doing because, of course, selling and kind of like introducing different products and services to people is something that I find deeply fascinating. And being able to help people along the way, of course, the products that I do are actually very kind of conservative. So regardless of what happens with the market, it doesn't really get affected too much. So it was quite consistent. It was just that I was working really hard for that particular mm-hmm. thing. Um, then I came to realize that, no, there's bigger things out there. And, you know, having spoken to Daniel and having spoken to my other partners, which I'll you may, maybe share at a later stage, mm-hmm. I realized there are massive things that I want to be involved with later on in life. Mm-hmm. So that's what I've been working towards. And I feel like one of the things that I've really enjoyed as a byproduct of my work was actually helping other people in their businesses. And that's actually how later you'll find that I got into, you know, watches and cars and got influence and how to help a lot of people along the way, mm-hmm. just purely because I was finding ways to kind of benefit other people first. Mm. Can you just expand on that part where you talked about the coasting? Sure. You started buying all the material goods. Sure. Because this is so similar to me. Yeah. Right? Okay. <laughs> and it it doesn't. You weren't content, were you? No, I wasn't. There. Yeah. Right. So it just goes to show that you know this this story that we're sold. Yeah, it's fake. It's a lie, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like you mm-hmm. get all this stuff. Yeah. And you're not happy. And you keep buying more stuff Mm -hmm. for a period of time. Could Mm -hmm. you think, it's because I don't have enough stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And then you realize it's got nothing to do with this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's what you're doing with your own life. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that was something I wanted to talk about. But I I think that's a really difficult topic because like, because we're going to touch something very sensitive here, but luxury is about that. It's about kind of selling you that story on kind of living a lifestyle that you think, okay, Mm -hmm. this is it. Yeah, but especially actually, Instagram right Insta- now. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right, with all that fake Instagram bullshit, right? Um, <laughs> but the funny thing is, I, I, I you know, I'm going to you know, eat my own words here, but I actually did yeah. a TED Talk about social no, media. What? I, know, I, didn't, I kept this really quiet, but now <laughs> I'm going to say We're going to have to if paste you, the link you, down Yeah, there. exactly. You'd say Alex Hell's TED Talk. I need to watch talk, this. And I was like constantly slagging about social media. Yeah. But the funny thing is, actually... That's how I actually met my my partner girlfriend at the moment in time. I, I met her through <laughs> oh. Instagram. I was like, I got, that's like eating my own words here now. <laughs> I met right. Dan through Instagram. Yeah, it's not a bad yeah. platform. Yeah, it's pretty Probably good. Probably better than Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So, how did all of this, you know, then entail into you collecting watches? How did you get into watches? Yeah. Sure. So, um, actually, it was actually through James May. I didn't tell you this, but um, I was watching Top Gear magazine because I used to be an avid like watcher so in the store we used to buy magazines for our customers and i used to kind of like reread all the um magazines and then james may wrote a watch which was the iwc portuguese chronograph and i was reading it and i was like okay it's quite nice and i was like <laughs> i was like how he wrote it i thought damn this guy's a you know he, he wrote it in a way which i thought was actually very elegant and cool um so I did some more research and then when I was 21 and I got like my bonus, the first thing I did was actually buy that watch. All right. So, um, really enjoyed it. I loved how clean what it was. Spec? It was the white face with the blue numerals, the classic. Okay. Yeah. And I had that, really enjoyed that watch. Then I started kind for of... How long? For about four or five years. I had it for a while actually. Okay. And then, um, then moving on to my second piece was actually a Jaeger. Because um, the next step for me was I wanted kind of like a travel watch because I was, you know, sometimes I would be traveling. It wasn't too often. Yeah. So I kind of bought like a dual time Jaeger with the Aston Martin. I was so embarrassing. But I bought the Aston Martin Cross Jaeger, the home time, master home time. Sucker. <laughs> so, yeah, absolute sucker, man. Yeah, sucker <laughs> and then, for those collab branding. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the first one to say I was. All right. So the next watch you should be getting is the Lamborghini Roger de Bui, yeah? No, 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 I'm not doing that. No, no, no. That, was, that was back then. That I kind of understood my ways. Yeah. Then I think I, it's small enough for your wrist. <laughs> <laughs> then actually, when I, I think um, I hit when I was 26, I really folk, I was kind of thinking a bit more about my watch collection. Because I wasn't really into watches. I was, I was, I did enjoy the watches, but I didn't really get into it. Um, then I started reading a lot of material online. Then, um, you know, I've read all the Patek's, I've read all the Rolexes, read all the AP, but I didn't go through that. The first thing I went was actually with F. P. Jean. So I brought wow. an F. P. Jean Chronometra Blue. So what happened there then? Yeah, because 
one thing I've realized that in Hong Kong, especially, a lot of people talk about Rolex or Asian people talk about Rolex all the yeah. time, and I hate it. Rolex is the symbol of like you made it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is Gold that, one. Is that, I, know, I didn't <laughs> yeah. know that. But I mean, like, I mean, like everyone kept talking about Rolex, and I kind of thought, well, I'm not like everyone else. I want to be different. Mm -hmm. So. I kind of researched all these independents and actually like quite famous websites that you come across that you see that. Then I looked at this particular watch. I thought that's really interesting. It's very different, you know. And then I just made the pop. Maybe I wasn't I wasn't sure what I was doing. Maybe, but I kind of thought like, okay, this is actually a lot more interesting than what's out there. And you have to really pay attention to what this piece is to buy it. So after buying that watch, the fourth watch I bought. Which one was which? FPJ Chronometer Blue. Blue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I bought. That Hang on. So what year did you buy that in? 2016. So this is way before the hype. Yeah. yeah way before the hype. Yeah. I've, I, so actually, did you get a discount on that piece? I got 169,000. No discount. I got it. Yeah, you still got it retail. Yeah, I got it retail. And how long yeah. did you wait for it? Oddly, two months. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, two months. <laughs> I, I got, the guy's called Jonathan. Unfortunately, yeah. left now in the Hong Kong landmark store. Um. I used to go in that store. He actually taught me a lot about watches. Um, through him, I saw Roger Smith, Philippe Dufour's, the Kari Vutelanian, saw Credo Aichis. So it's he was really a one. Cool. It was it was actually yeah. he influenced me massively. Mm -hmm. um, then there's another store called The Independence in uh, Peda Building. So mm -hmm. I used to go in there, and we used to talk about watches. And I see you know Roman Gautiers and uh, the like. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like that way of life. And then when you go to like these Patek stores and AP stores or Rolex stores. The service you get doesn't really do it for you, and the mm -hmm. pieces there aren't as interesting. Mm -hmm. So for me, I had this kind of love affair for um, independence. Because you also uh, got a Lauren Ferry, one of the I few did. people that I actually know exactly got right. one of those pieces. Yeah, I did. So 2017 Christmas, I got a Lauren Ferry. I actually customized it. Um, so um, I went to Kingfort Masterpiece. I was looking for Lauren Ferry because I couldn't afford a Philip Dufour. Because someone offered to me at that time for a million Han dollars. Dumb. Ass. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What a dumbass. So I was like, No, but come on. This guy's supposed million. to be smart, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know. I mean, come on, because the, yeah. the the watch was like forty thousand US, wasn't it? Yeah. When it was launched, and um, so now yeah. it's like one million Hong Kong dollars. That's still yeah. a lot of money, yeah. man. Yeah, I mean, one like, million. Think about all the No, no, it's a lot of money. I think now though. That watch is just going to consistently go. It's one of those pieces that you know consistently will never drop below a certain price, yes, and will probably yeah. just continue to rise. And you just have to make make um, more money like, than, mm -hmm. faster than inflation. That yeah, that, that watch is inflating. Yeah. So right, we'll, we'll work hard enough, and one day we'll get there. You know, I <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, forget it. It's just like torture me with it. No, so, so. Um, you you really like Lauren Ferry? I love Lauren Ferry. Yeah, it's yeah. one of your favorite brands. It is. What yeah. is it about it? Yeah. I just love how it fits on the wrist so perfectly well. It's just so round and smooth and it feels like a pebble. So it just, it's got this kind of subtle class to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so at some point I will go back and get another one. Um, but it's just like, there's a few other pieces that are in my checklist, which I have to kind of go through before I go to that. Okay. So you've, you've mentioned a few watches here. You've got the FPJ, yeah, Chronometric cool. Blur. Uh, the Laurent Ferrier yep. and yep. the uh, IWC. Yeah. What would you actually say your flavor of watches is? Like, what 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 style do you kind of like? I like simple watches, clean, mm. okay. like like simple and take out. I think just make it as clean as possible. Um, I don't really like date windows, um, mm. which is actually one of my weird things. I don't pet peeves. Yeah, pet peeves, right? I don't like date windows, especially if you have a few watches. You have to adjust them, etc. So for me, it's kind of kind of an annoyance um but for me yeah simple watches clean subtle less than 40 millimeters preferably yeah you know, that sort of style so how do you see these watches fitting into your like lifestyle how current are they to your lifestyle how important are they to your lifestyle well the funny thing is um with watch collecting with i think with anyone that goes out there your tastes evolve and you know you you are spending a lot of time to really understand about yourself and who you are so for those watches, sadly, some of them are actually parted because once you wear it for two, three years, you do get bored mm -hmm, of it. Mm -hmm. And when you get bored of it, you want to look for the next thing that you want to kind of preserve and keep. So there are a few watches out there that you could actually say this is like your own collection mm. um, that you want to develop towards. Mm. So my taste is, I guess, is always evolving. But I think I'm getting to a stage now where I really know what I really want. Okay, that's great. Um, what kind of enjoyment? does watch collecting give you um 
great question. I think it's a combination. I, okay, so, so I, even though this is a watch podcast, for me, it's kind of like it, sh- it should be your whole package. Mm-hmm. So watches are just a part of it. Then there's also cars. There's your tailoring. Mm-hmm. There's the books that you read. You you as a person, mm-hmm. like your manners, like all these things in life is actually you should be pursuing. Mm-hmm. So watches is actually an interesting part, but still a relatively small part of my life. Okay, but it's actually, it's, but it's quite yeah. influential still. And hmm. um, the fact with watch collecting, which I find, is actually the people that you meet. The yeah. people that you interact with, actually, that's the best part of watch collecting. Mm. So mm. you could be wearing a Seiko, like a normal, not even a Grand Seiko, just a Seiko, a Casio, mm-hmm. you know, these sort of pieces and really be into watches as well. There's a massive community of people that are like fascinated with those pieces that, you know, know a lot and have a lot of fun with. So what kind of research do you do when you actually like find a piece that you might like or you see a piece? And how actually forget that. But before that, how do you even know about find a new piece that you like? Um, I think in gatherings, so we're lucky in Hong Kong that with these collectors, you see lots of different pieces. We have this luxury where we do social gatherings and you see all these pieces together and then you can kind of like try them. And I think like cars, you can't just look at the picture. You have to see the thing in real life and you actually have to drive it. So with watches, I find the the most enjoyable part is these gatherings and you kind of learn new things amongst other people and little nuances and stories and histories and um, those things actually add to the watch itself as to the value right okay um where do you see your watch collection now going then because you're going to a place where you're staying that you're very comfortable with where is what where's next um so i think there's two watches that i do have in mind that i want to get into and kind of slowly build towards um of course um I'm, i'm allowed to say this one that is actually the one that I've been really getting into, and I think the one that I've been actually um, learning through the most was actually through Audemars Piguet. So I spent a lot of time with the guys at AP and having mm-hmm. kind of developed that kind of relationship with them and understanding about like the Royal Oak, which mm-hmm. is probably the most iconic, you know, stainless steel watch to kind of really change the current generation. I think AP has kind of been quite influential to me. Mm-hmm. And then I do want to go to, to more in, uh, independence um, and understanding kind of like Lawn Ferries again, Credo Aichi 2 is another one that I've been really looking into for a long time. Debit tunes are quite exciting and pr- probably a vintage. So I think from each segment, whether it's like a quite a big brand itself, a independent and also a vintage, I think those three is where I want to slowly get into. But all the pieces that I really like. How about like, how much does price? I'm talking about not just retail price. Yep. How well the piece holds value play in your factor is one of the decisions to purchase a watch. Great question. Um, for me, yes, let's say 70%. Yeah. So, because you're in wealth management, right? Yeah, I am. And sure, if you're just yeah. throwing money down the drain, you don't really, you're not really doing it for me, bro. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean like, I mean, the great, I mean, great response to that. I think, okay, so yes, I think 70%. As in, what, what do I mean by that? Like, as long as I'm not going to be losing a ridiculous amount of money, like, as soon as I buy mm-hmm. it, then tomorrow it drops 50%, then it's probably not a good idea. But if I can get it for, like, let's say a decent price or a price which I don't mind losing, then it's okay. So, um, that independent, I know that if I was to buy it, I'm going to take a hit. But if it's okay for me to take the hit, then it's good. It means I really would enjoy that watch. So, that's why I think with independence, it's a little bit trickier because you have to make it to watch that you will feel very happy with for a long amount of time so you can really get a lot of longevity from it. So when it does yeah. come to, let's say you do sell it, you'd be, oh, okay, I actually enjoyed 10 years of this piece. Yeah. And to me, I think that's pretty good. I don't know if this, that's the, like, because I'm not really a car person. Right. But do you use that same philosophy when you're buying cars? Yeah, oh yeah, cars depreciate like anything. Yeah, right? yeah that's so, even I mean, worse. Like, so, yeah, it's yeah. even worse. How yeah. do you justify the car then? And then you can't kind of apply the same for the watch. Unfortunately, that's true because, um, with cars, there's there's another thing to cars because there is an actual use to it. Mm-hmm. Like it does actually take you from A to B, and there is this sort of sensation. In Hong Kong, yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> you still can, man. you still can, you still can. Um, you'd be surprised how far I can get you with certain places. Um, but with cars, it's actually you get like the engine sound, the sensation of driving. Mm-hmm. So there's another factor towards a vehicle itself. Whereas with watches, it's purely let's say marketing. You yeah. know, the watches has no use fundamentally. So it's just purely for yeah. you to kind of, let's say, enjoy through what the marketing and what 
others think of you yeah. and that notion where you where people say you, you shouldn't give a f about what other people think of you that's kind of bullshit <laughs> like everyone does care about what other people think let's be honest you know let's not let's not lie to ourselves the but, business setting yeah you can't with the watch, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. where not everybody, you know, drives. And if you do drive, you are parking it in a, a few, car park. just a few places, just a few, right? Yeah. right? For you, I think you only use two car parks. Yeah, <laughs> IFC in Pacific Place. Yeah, that's it, right? <laughs> yeah. And but when you go to those business meetings, you have mm -hmm. a watch on your wrist. It's much better than, as you have referred to, no, but... chucking a bunch of Lamborghini <laughs> keys on the table. No, but exactly, you know what? Yeah. I totally agree with Alex. I've always thought to myself, when the watch hits a price. That can that surpasses like a dream watch. I would rather buy the car because you can feel the car when you're driving. Someone yeah. can even sit next to you. Yep. But a watch is just a piece of metal like on your wrist. Right. Mm. Yeah. You 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 have a lot to buy though. You've got shoes. You've got jewelry. <laughs> Wait, but, you've got clothing. Can we clarify? Alex probably spends more on his no, clothes. No, I don't. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? It's like <laughs> I don't. I want. <laughs> well, how much is your most expensive suit? Um, Can I put it on record now? Uh, no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's but Chippinelli. I want to go back on a the point that Alex made just now. So he said, it's not just about watches. It's, it's about how you dress, the books you read, your personality, everything, right? I just want to talk about his fashion sense. Um, when you wake up and you get dressed, or even when you choose a watch, do you think about your wardrobe and you go, this piece is going to go with everything I have? Or you make your clothes, like you go and get your clothes made to match a watch? Oh, that's a great question. No, I think the watch matches the clothes. So as soon as you put on the, the attire first, and or whatever you're doing that day, let's say if it's a weekend, you're gonna be more casual. Mm -hmm. Of course you dress casually, then you need a casual watch. So it's kind of like, it, it, it fits better, doesn't it? Oh. All right, on that, but on that point then, yep. most of the time you're in a suit. Mm -hmm. Even today, you're like, smart, right? right. And it's what, Saturday today, right? Yep. Uh, most of the time when you're in a suit, like I see you're wearing the IP, Yep. right? IP is traditionally a sports watch. Yes, it is. So why are you wearing that? So the IP is actually quite an interesting piece because it's kind of like it fits everywhere. And okay. because it's like 30 mil 39 millimeters, it's quite small. Um, and it's kind of like a thin bracelet. I think it's actually a piece that goes well with everything else. And also because Hong Kong is actually hot and mm. humid, mm -hmm. the last thing you want to wear is a leather strap watch. Mm -hmm. So I think you, you can only get away with rubber and bracelet, to be honest. Mm. So I think that's why I really like wearing steel bracelet watches. Okay, so you're happy to break certain like traditional rules, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. which I agree with. I yeah. think, you know. Mm -hmm. Practicality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, practicality, number one. And, right. and leather straps, you're just going to go through a crap ton, man, in Hong Kong. Right. Mm. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. Like when I had the um the leather strap watches, like Lauren Ferrier's, I had to replace the straps every year, basically. Yeah, okay, it's like, quite uncomfortable. Yeah, as yeah. well when it's hot. So, um, I guess a very standard question. Sure. Holy Grail. Philip Dufour simplicity, <laughs> <laughs> okay. which you missed out on, <laughs> which I missed out on for a million dollars. So, yeah. is that? Uh, actually goes on to the next question. Yeah. Do you regret buying or selling or <laughs> any regrets in your watch journey? He regrets um, not yeah. buying Ice Link. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, I've been quite wise because yeah, actually, for you. Yeah. No, actually, I, I've um, on record. I've actually been very lucky in my watch letting game because I've actually been very, very like cautious what, with whatever I buy. Mm -hmm. So. Frankly speaking, the 15202 IP is actually my first AP watch. Mm -hmm. The 5711 was actually actually my first Nautis I bought from King Fook at Masterpiece as well. Mm -hmm. So the Chronometra Blue was actually my first FB Jean I bought. Mm. Um, so in terms of all the watches I've purchased, I have to say I've been very kind of fortunate to get the pieces that you know I really enjoyed, but at the same time um, were relatively easy for me to get, so to speak. Okay, so you touch on it. Um... AP, in particular IP, that yep. just goes on to this, re this next segment for us, really. Okay, sure. So that's your first AP, like you say. I think it's limited to 250 pieces that's or correct. something, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Uh, I think most of them have gone. Yep. And I also know that you weren't first in line for that watch. Awesome. You actually didn't want it at the beginning. And then yeah, I think it was nine months in, you, you kind of asked for that watch. And you managed to get it with no previous AP buying record, right? That's Which right. is basically, to many collectors, unheard of. Right. How how did you get that piece? So the fortunate thing about being a salesperson is I understand the importance of being a salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of sales like lining up at AP. Yeah. So no, but okay. Let, let, I'll I'll be straightforward in life. Yeah. Um, I feel like especially in the watch community, actually in business in general, a lot of people are always thinking, what can I get from that person? Mm -hmm. Whereas I always reverse the question. So this is actually a secret to how I do business. 
um, from myself personally is what can I do for that person? Mm -hmm. So for AP, it was like, I got along with um, the old CEO, which was David Von Guzen, very close friend of mine, still meet up with him now, mm -hmm. even with his new position. Um, and it was always like, okay, I want to understand what AP is about, what mm -hmm. does it stand for? You know, what are the clients that he's looking for? And having really delved deep and build that relationship with him, I understand the importance of selling. I mm -hmm. understand the importance that AP also has to have the other pieces, you know, part. So for me, I was always doing these uh, social gatherings, these events with AP. They looked after me. They looked after my friends. Also because my clients uh, are interested in watches and they also want to have the opportunity to meet, let's say, a CEO or someone that can look after them. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a few of these events, gatherings, anyone that's always looking for an AP, I always divert it to them. And then that's how we built the relationship. So I think after, you know, I guess I was a, an AP staff, if you could say. <laughs> like, okay. and then selling not my on the soul. payroll, not on the payroll, Not on the payroll, but I mean, like, no, but you build a great relationship. I'm really good. I mean, mm -hmm. also what I've come to realize is when people go to, let's say, any sort of luxury, hospitality, service, they always want the staff there to treat them like kings and gods. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of rudeness to it as well. Yeah. If you go to like a peninsula and then you see some of the staff get treated by the customers, it's actually uncomfortable. But it's actually quite refreshing if you're a staff there where a customer is actually very close with you, you know, who enjoys spending time with you, right? Do you know, that's because me and you, yeah, did that. Yeah, that's probably why, yeah. Yeah, 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 I mean? yeah of course. We yeah. got talked to like, well, I, I definitely got talked to like yeah. a piece of shit. Yeah. Right, many a time. Yeah. Sometimes I think I got talked to like a piece of shit, not even because I worked there, just because I was Chinese. Um, <laughs> no, literally. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's why I think you're sensitive to it. So oh, I'm yeah, really sensitive no, to no, it too. No, of course I am. No, yeah. of course I am. So, um, so for me, it wasn't like, okay, I need to suck up to people. That's not what's it, what's it about. It was more about like, how can I make their life a little bit easier? I mean, a close friend of mine, you know, Parisian gentleman, Hugo Jacquemet, massive credit to him. He had a lovely quote, which I think you and I use quite often, which was elegance is the ability to put others at ease. Mm -hmm. So if I was to kind of like summarize how one should behave, that would be it. And mm -hmm. so when I was at AP, built that great relationship with David. And since you have that great relationship, you want to make sure everyone that's under him, that, you know, is, is, a, is a comfortable, you know, yes, I am a client, but at the same time, I shouldn't be above you or you should be below me or I should be below mm. you. Mm. It's like everyone should be mutual. Mm. You know, we should all spend time to understand each other. Mm. So I remember when I got the IP, um, Kevin gave me a phone call. Uh, I'll go to that story later on. But mm. I remember going up to the store and as soon as everyone saw me, I can see that it was actually not me that was beaming. They were all beaming. Mm -hmm. Like they were all mm -hmm. happy for me. So yeah. for me, it was like, that was what I think life's about. I think kind of everyone that's around you should be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, and that person you just mentioned, Kevin. Yes. Like, he's obviously the commercial director now at Correct. AP. Yep. But he wasn't always the commercial director. No, he director. wasn't. He yeah. wasn't. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. Yeah. So this is what I... Great question. Uh, great um, sensitivity there, Daniel. Because when I, when I think it was 2017 or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, we did a watch event with AP. And um, he wasn't... He was actually not a senior guy at the time mm -hmm. but like i said because i was close to everyone mm -hmm. and i was friends with him friends with all the other staff there then of course when david moved on he actually slowly progressed up so then he saw how i interacted with him from the early days mm -hmm. and now he's in a senior position then now because i've got that relationship he knows who i am for a few years that's why he can trust me with or he knows who i am and he can trust me with certain pieces as well yeah okay i just want to say like um there's a lot of people listening right now they're probably like Okay, great. So you know the senior management. How do I get there? I will never get to meet these people, right? But there's another point, which is I think, Alex, you underestimate how you carry yourself, right? right. From AP's perspective, I really think they want to give pieces to people who actually wear it, who carry it well, right? They don't really care if you have money. That's, yeah. yeah. Okay. No wonder why they won't give me it. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> no <laughs> that is I, right. <laughs> wait, don't worry, I've dressed you up. You'll be getting there slowly. <laughs> so. Because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot, like, I have to be honest here, there's a lot of people who are mad, right? That yeah, I, I spend how, how much money at AP, but I really want to be like, no, F you, right? You're not wearing the watch correctly. Right? Yeah, okay. I mean, well, that's a very difficult topic. I mean, I don't want to cause any qualms, but I, yeah. I kind of get what you're trying to yeah. say. I guess there's a lot of people out there who just dump money into a brand and think like they can get anything they want. Entitled. Yeah. Entitled, is that? Yeah, yeah. You, you could say that. Um, but I think, yes and no. I think from a mm -hmm. business perspective, I do appreciate that there are certain pieces that you have to kind of sell. Yeah. Like the diamond 
watches. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have yeah. to have fun. You, have to, yeah. you can't. It's, they're not easy. Luckily, to we have yeah, long I mean, on that. We can push that. <laughs> long, long, go, go for it. Yeah. Please sponsor I mean, me. <laughs> so, so, no, I, I understand. So, if, if, like, yes, I think in in any business, not just in watches, like Ferrari does it all the time. Mm-hmm. To get a La Ferrari, you have to get like a Ferrari Portofino 4AA, mm-hmm. the 812, the GTC4 Lusso. Mm-hmm. Then you might be able to get the La Ferrari. Mm-hmm. Um, so with watches, I understand the same perspective. Yeah. But I also what I really appreciate about AP and actually some other brands that they actually care about the collector. Mm. Mm. They. Um, that's a strong message that's coming out from yeah. people that we see that are tied to AP. Yeah. And they really pay attention to who's getting that piece. Mm-hmm. Can they wear it regularly? Do they say good things about that brand? Do mm-hmm. they represent it well enough? Because mm-hmm. I think luxury is, is, is a really difficult balancing act because you have to create enough pieces to keep everyone happy, but rare enough mm-hmm. so it's luxury. You feel special. You feel yeah. special. Yeah. If they just start in announcing that, yeah, for the, let's say, 15202 IP, they're going to make 5,000, it's not going to be special. If like even with bags like mm-hmm, Hermes, mm-hmm. if all of a sudden you can walk in there and get like a Birkin yeah. or Kelly, yeah. then it's not going to be special. It's not going to be special. Yeah. So unfortunately, the game is that actually you're not going to be able to get every piece. And so for me with AP, I'm okay with that. I don't expect to get every piece from AP, but there's mm-hmm. a piece I really want. Mm. I want to make it known that I want it. Mm. And yeah. like I, I will become your salesperson to get it. I, I think, yeah. I think, I think okay. the main, the, the, the topic, the sensitive topic is like, yeah, people putting a lot of money down and thinking that they should get it. And actually with these brands now that business model is slightly different it isn't about not it's not just you turn up to a shop you have money and then i can buy it and because i spent so much with you i buy it it is all about what is the relationship between the consumer and the brand yeah i love that yeah and yes spending money is spending power that is one type of relationship but it's definitely not the most personal relationship. Mm-hmm. And I think certain brands are now going towards, especially luxury, yep. going towards, no, it isn't just a shop you come in and you can like, what do you mean, my child? Yep. Like, mm-hmm. you can like buy groceries. Exactly. It's, Go to 7-Eleven. It's totally up my yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Build Build up a relationship with the brand and that's where I think it's going. It's almost going to back how it used to be. Well, I'll echo the words from like Max Busa, where I, I remember he did an interview where he said like every one of his customers is, is a part of the design process, where the funds that he get from a watch being sold, you know, some of it goes to like marketing, some of, some of it goes, maybe actually not even marketing, some of it goes to his staff, some of it goes to the movement, some of it goes to like the business. So for me, it's with watches, it's the same thing that you know, you have to be involved with the brand and the brand has to feel as if they can be involved with you. Mm. So I guess you kind of answer this. Okay. But is there any more advice that you would give to collectors that haven't got into AP that want to get into AP? Well, um, put me on the spot. I'm not an AP salesperson. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, okay, so first of all, okay, regardless of AP or not, is really understand why you're buying that watch. Yes, there is a factor of um, you don't want to lose money. Yes, there's a factor of you want an iconic piece. Yes, everyone, there's a fact that everyone talks about it. But you have to ask yourself, are you someone that really understands the watch well enough? And are you really, really going to enjoy that piece? Or you just, are you mainly, I mean, not like I said to you earlier, yes, you know, worrying about what other people think about you does play some sort of impact on you, mm. but it shouldn't be everything. Mm. There should, there's a there's a little hint towards it. Mm. So I think if you want to get if you want to get an AP, first of all, spend some time to really understand AP, understand the piece you're buying, and know why you're buying it. I think that goes for every watch, really. Okay. So how about all those collectors that you know can't afford AP? Entry level. Yep. They want to get into watches. They still want to make a good impression, right? Yep. Where where can they start? He's like, can you dress properly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, no, no. But thing is, I would much. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would dress properly first. I would say, yeah, dress properly first. That's a great one. Okay. Dress properly first, and then I don't go believe. To watch I, I don't think your shoes are that cheap either. <laughs> Dan's gonna be like, can you lose some weight, please? <laughs> No, okay, so when you get into watches, yeah, I mean... Lung's going to be like, can you go and get a six-pack first? <laughs> Which Definitely. is basically like never. So you never <laughs> even get into the No, game. wrong, man. The, the easiest way to get yourself into Lung's heart is get some egg toss to her. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> we need to add in the Mandarin Oriental ones. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Mandarin Oriental egg tarts. <laughs> Actually. Choice. And big house. Secret yeah. here. Those what? Auntie Anne pretzels. Auntie Anne pretzels and Cinnabon. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but no, but with watches, yeah, I mean, like, there's, I mean, there are certain brands out there, depending on price, that are quite good value, like mm-hmm. Longines and, you know, IWC, No Moss is going to be German brands. You told me before, Seiko's are great, Grand Seiko's are great. Mm. You know, I'm slowly getting really into, like, Grand Seiko's from mm. you. Uh, Lang and Sonne, like Daniel's influence on me. Yes. <laughs> like, well, what I would say is, one person I respect is Ariel Adams at Abort to Watch, right? He came to the first Shanghai Watch Festival and I, had, I was having dinner with him. And I was just, uh, well, I was wearing the Lange, they look rough. And then he was like, oh, you know, it's a really nice piece, blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, yeah, I just said, I'm just kind of like a normal collector. And he actually said, Daniel, you're not a normal collector, right? He says, normal collectors don't collect like that, like how you guys are collecting here in the <laughs> Shanghai watch game. And I said, yeah, you know what? I'm actually going a bit numb, man, to some of these pieces, you know, like, and there seems to be, um, I'm running out of pieces, mm-hmm. right? I don't want to have to keep waiting for one year for one or two pieces that just come and, you know, I might not like them anyway. And he said, go back, go back to the start of your journey because what you'll realize is you missed so much on your way up the first time and you'll miss a lot of brands out and actually Oris is one of those brands and well, I, I, really I never good. I never even like knew about Oris right right until I went back had a look what did I miss right because around that level I'm just thinking you know Tag Heuer long jeans mm-hmm. you know this kind of stuff yeah totally missed this and I was like oh man you know and then yeah it is to go back to have a, a full appreciation of watches right rather than just like straight up to FPJ, François Bourgeon, and then like Patek yeah. and stuff like that, right? That's yeah. great. No, that's, I, I really like yeah. that as well. You it's know, good. Alex yeah. just picked up the G-Shark, right? Yeah, yeah I love that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got a Casio. Casio. Yeah. It is a Casio. <laughs> all black. Yeah. GA2 1000 1A1. Clearly, yeah. he was thinking about the premium. And no waiting list. Oh, yeah, list. man. Uh, no, actually, <laughs> I had to pay a premium for the piece, actually. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? They're all sold out? How much? <laughs> that, how much is that worth trading for now? It's 1,500 Hong Kong. Is that double? Yeah, about that yeah, yeah right it was. <laughs> no but then i was lucky because our mutual friend lewis actually yeah. got me one so i was like that's okay, right yeah. That. yeah okay cue some dms to lewis now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry right so yesterday we were at the uh phillips auction preview yes right uh for their first online sale okay vintage mm-hmm. you haven't mentioned anything vintage are you going to mm. go into vintage uh or is there a reason why you're not into vintage yet you know tell me about that no, lovely question. Um, I do love vintage, you know, but for me, the Patek chronograph, which everyone talks about, again, I don't know. I mean, is it fatigue or something? Because I'm seeing it all the time and everyone talks about which it. Which one? Like all the 15, the 18, 24, yeah. 99, 39, 70, 59, 70, 5004, uh, 52, 70. Everyone talks about this that's all a bit, the that's, time. That's do you know what? People are going to hear that, right? Yeah. And they're thinking, oh my God, this guy keeps ahead. seeing these like 39, 70, 24, 99. <laughs> like this guy, what is he talking about? No, sorry. I mean, where um, does he hang out? Yeah, like, <laughs> no, no. Uh, they're great pieces, but to me, I haven't. Like, yeah, maybe I'm not there yet, but I don't appreciate it that much. And for that mm-hmm. level of money, I'm not kind of, I'm not like a multimillionaire where I can just kind of fling mm-hmm. a million US dollars into getting these pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, but agreed, I think for Patek, I think everyone's talking about the Nautilus. I think that's a mistake. The one that they should be paying attention to is the Perpetual Calendar Chronos and also the World Timers, because that's Patek. That's Patek. Through that's through. Patek, mm-hmm. yeah. you know. That's where the connoisseurs play. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So yeah. everyone listen carefully. You're playing Nautiluses. Wrong game, guys. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, we had this discussion, but anyone that wears like a Nautilus now, I don't know what to really read about you. I mean, is, is that... So what do you read then? Not that piece, clearly. Or a Rolex Daytona <laughs> or some Mariner. I can't tell anything about you. So then I look at what you're wearing, how you carry yourself. Then yeah. I get a slight better sense of who this person is. Can I just point out, I bumped into Ivan yesterday at AP House and he was wearing a Daytona and he oh, just so. reminded me again. Damn, I gotta sell every single watch you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Daytona 57, 11, 1, 5, 2, 2, 5, yeah. <laughs> He's not gonna have any watches yeah. left. No. <laughs> um, yeah. But no, with Vin- but I do, again, like the Paul Newman Daytonas, yeah, I love them to bits. I mean, they're just so timeless. I mean, I, I understand why they go for so much money. Because I think for a piece for... It's that design, isn't it? Yeah, it's that longevity. It's mm. just so damn good. I mean, I don't... Frankly speaking, I don't like Rolex. You know, if there's anyone who's a Rolex guy, I'm sorry, but I'm not a big fan of Rolexes. There's a million of you every year coming out. So, like, <laughs> like, so, like, so for me, it doesn't really echo anything to me. And the fact that, it, like Daniel mentioned, everyone in like or Chinese background, mm-hmm. all they talk about is Rolex. Hmm. What about vintage Rolex? 
so again i'm not a big fan of the subs yeah. I, but the only one i really do like i mean there's always was it the oddball or the the black sheep or something mm -hmm. is that you know it literally is the art deco style of the exotic style of the paul newman oh, that's, that's the only one that i really like yeah i i like it but don't I, like it. it's not a million dollars i don't like, like the price of yeah. it <laughs> yeah um if it wasn't that price yeah totally i'm yeah. down right yeah. but right. yesterday at the preview you haven't been yet, have you? I haven't. Yeah, I'm we excited. have to go. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god, the vintage Pateks. It's like just somebody opened like Harry Potter's like toy shop or something. I'm just like, damn. And then like Thomas was telling me about how to look at the, mm -hmm. the dials, how they've been retouched or non-retouched, yeah. the polishing, the yeah. the I'll hallmarks. So. It, mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, oh man, I feel like I'm. I'm, I'm just like magically been sold. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> damn, like I'm going to be looking at this vintage stuff. Well, it's good because like, you know, things float different people, right? Well, so I, do think, I do think pretty cool. with modern watches, right, there is a limit. Mm -hmm. And I think with vintage watches, what I'm also intrigued to ask Thomas next time I see him mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. he was into modern watches. Then he fell in love with vintage watches. I feel like I want to fall in love with vintage watches too. But let's be clear. Yesterday he was wearing a debit tune though. Yeah, it was a unique piece. That's unique. <laughs> yeah. a unique piece de Bethune sure that get, yeah. was for his wedding. Yeah. Oh, that's, okay. that's, that's meaningful. Now that's yeah. meaningful. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. Yeah. I mean, th I think that's why with independence there is that better interaction because you can get really close with the maker and get something yeah. specifically yeah, to you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Which I really love. You can't really just meet Thierry Stern. Oh yeah, because I, I think if I was to, I mean, going back to that point, if I was to get like a really unique piece, let's say to celebrate like a wedding or something, mm -hmm. I would choose like the DB25 Starry Various where you can actually have the constellation of a day. I would choose that oh. day for the marriage. Oh. And that'd be very special, wouldn't it? That is special. Yeah, but yeah. I would do DB28. Yeah. Still. Hang on, you're, you're one of those people that said... I'm talking to Lung yeah. here. Okay, so gonna, yeah, right. like, um, fuck the rings. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Just get me the watches, yeah, right, just for the your watch. wedding. Yeah, fifty-two seventy-one p. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's not right, just anyway, it's not just anyway. any watch. Right, okay, I'm just like down. using this podcast calm as an advert. Calm down. <laughs> yeah, like, forget the yeah. uh, was it yeah. these um, couples watches from JLC the Reverso. <laughs> She's <laughs> very straight yeah. to that one. They're very very clear. So. You've mentioned, we did mention this before in the podcast, which was the watch community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How important is it? Um, this, okay, so watch community in general, you have to be careful because there are some good ones and some terrible ones. Yeah. Right. So uh, what I mean by terrible ones, you know what I'm trying to say. I'm not going to mm -hmm. bother mm -hmm. going, going into too much details. Mm -hmm. But the really good ones are the ones that you can actually get information, knowledge, and they actually help you. Yeah, yeah, they actually give you some sort of guidance. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that you need to kind of get close to because sometimes it can change. It can, with watches, unfortunately, it touches on so many different levels of so many different classes and you kind of need them all. But if they're only focusing on, let's say, you know, how much, who's baller, who's got the biggest wow piece, then I think it's quite dry. It's quite yeah. empty. Yeah. Don't yeah. pay attention to those guys. But if it's kind of like people who have this really passionate um, and knowledge. This, knowledge and they're really enjoying all these different pieces yeah mm. those ones are really good so i think mm. like frankly speaking what shanghai watch gang and what this podcast is doing i think that exposure is actually quite phenomenal mm. and you know not really having um, been able to meet daniel before um and just looking at what he's been doing yeah you would you would kind of think like okay maybe it's just full of kind of showy people but then once you know the community inside it you realize wow it's a different game entirely mm. it's like the people that you hang around with is actually yeah. really impressive and massive credit. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest misunderstandings of me, right? Which is like people, I guess, think, yeah, he hangs around with super baller people, and I kind of do, like, but they aren't just the only people I hang around with. And let's be honest, we all meet ballers that are always, there's always a bigger whale in the, oh, in sure. the sea, right? It doesn't matter who you think you are, there's always stay humble. Absolutely. But then I think some people come into the group, and yeah, do you know what? If you want to talk Seiko, I'll talk Seiko with you. You want to talk about like G-Shocks? I'll talk G-Shock with you. You want to talk about long jeans, tackle? I'll talk. I'll talk to you about it. Yeah, no problem at all. That's awesome. No, it's not yeah. just about like RMs, Nautilus, AP. You know, I'm happy to talk. And do you know what? I'm happy to listen to your story, and for me to learn something that I didn't know about with your piece. You know, I mean, we've got people in the group that wear Tiso. You know. You no, know, like I don't know. I think it's like 17 year old wears Tiso, and you know, it's cool. a very special piece to him. I love to see how his eyes light up when he talks about his own piece. Mm -hmm. 
because one thing that I really still enjoy is yes, some of the group have really amazing pieces. I mean, to you know, you two have amazing pieces, right? And for somebody that dreams about these watches, like really loves these watches, mm -hmm. when they meet you and you interact with them, you let them try on mm -hmm. this watch. Mm -hmm. The magic you see in their eyes is just, it's like million bucks, yeah, it's man. Priceless. Yeah, it's yeah. priceless, right? Because yeah. you it just is. made their day and they, and then you take their watch yeah. and you put it on their wrist and they feel times two yeah. million bucks yeah. that they've got validation yeah. from yeah. another person. And mutual it's, respect, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, mutual respect. Yeah. But for people listening, how do they get into these groups? I guess they, I It's know, tough really. in Hong Kong, yeah. 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 That actually goes into my, yeah, the question. Okay. Yeah, which was like, yeah, what is your experience of the groups? You know, actually, Lung, maybe you can give some. Well, I had a tough time, honestly, because it's like, well, I used to live in Singapore, moving here, and um, I'm sure a lot of people who are listening feel this. You feel lonely because you know you have this hobby, you have this passion, but how do you find these group of people? So for me, it was like just telling myself, okay, like step out of your comfort zone, start your Instagram. And if you know mm. me personally, you know I'm actually really shy, introverted, right? Yeah. But it's just being like, okay, I'm just going to do that. And I'm going to see who connects with me. But if I didn't have Instagram as a platform, I actually wouldn't even know where to start. Hang on. So, so you did, when you did the Instagram, yeah. you didn't know that there was a community there. You thought that one day I'm just going to start posting watches. I knew there was um, vintage Rolex Hong Kong, which is huge. But I knew there's no way I can enter that because I don't, in my head, I'm like, I don't have a vintage Rolex. I don't even know how to connect with these people. She doesn't like vintage Rolexes either. Yeah, and, and the price tag <laughs> yeah, is very high. Tag. Yeah. So then you're like, okay, let me try and go to some of these watch events. So go to some of these AP dinners and then realize you don't actually make a single friend. <laughs> so you leave and you go back to your own life. Yeah. It's oh, tough. okay. Yeah. Right. There's a disconnect. Yeah. Right. right. Maybe we need to sort that out. Yeah, we do. Have, uh, have this podcast here, right? Anybody that wants to join the community, reach out to us. Yeah. And yeah. we will link you up appropriately in the, wherever you are, whether in, a, in the whole the whole Asia really yeah. Yeah. region, right? Yeah. Yeah. We should get a website up. Yeah. So everybody reach out to us, say shit. hellos. If you want to ask any about questions yeah. and watches, please do. Yeah, and if you yeah. need any wealth management, you know who to find. No, don't Alex. need to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, he don't said one dollar. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll take that back. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, apart from watches, though, mm -hmm. you've already touched on that, you know, the, the cars and, oh, yeah. and clothing. What is it about those things that ignites your, your, your passion? And what other things are you interested in? Um, it's all about attention to detail. I think um, I think in everything in life, it all comes down to detail. So how you interact with people, even the way you dress, like you've just mentioned, cars, what car you buy, um, to what level you understand what you're doing. I think that, I, I'm not trying to get into too philosophical or get into too deep, but I think trying to kind of hone yourself to kind of, let's say, projecting who you are and trying to be who you are yourself is actually very important. I think it's something that not many people really have the fortune to really understand. I am think I'm quite lucky to really understand myself well enough. Mm -hmm. So yes, I appreciate, let's say, the latest McLarens and Ferraris and um, Lamborghinis. But to me, I kind of know exactly what I like. So I'm confident to wear that and buy that and enjoy that mm -hmm. for that particular reason. How much, like, you don't have to say any figures, but mm -hmm. just say percentage, right? Are you willing to spend of your annual income, right, on this presentation um i would say like 15 20 percent okay that's, that's what i thought it's yeah. like it's it's i think it's it's still hefty amount. It's still hef no no don't get me wrong it's still hefty but it's kind of something you interact and bond well with others i'll give you an example so with the watch community um i have some fantastic friends some fantastic fantastic clients in the watch community and the fact that i'm putting money into that scene mm -hmm. actually i can get back as well it's because I'm building, actually, it's like you're building friendship, you're building relationships through that kind yeah. of interaction. Yeah. It's the same with cars. You, you know, you have to spend a little to kind of be connected with those people in those groups. And you also have that same deep connection. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it's that kind of, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's another language, like having watches yeah. and cars and yeah. suits. It's kind of like a language in itself. Mm. And you're kind of spending money on that language and education, which you're interacting with people. Mm. It's just, it's kind of like investing in yourself. It's it like is. an education. Totally. You're is, upgrading totally. yourself. Totally. And everything. Yeah. Absolutely. There Absolutely. Is, it, it, it's like kind of true, sad, but true. 
is when you kind of um, go into the probably higher society circles, it is about knowledge and yep. culture and appreciation of certain things. Otherwise, you can't just talk business straight in. It always have to be softer. You have yeah. to be either talking about like watches, clothing, um, traveling. Yeah. Right? Yep. To it's almost like a gauge of your person. You know, when you just thought about like how presentable you are, part of that's like a a visual DD, so due diligence, right? But then your experiences, which people try and eke out slowly out of you, right, subtly, that's also due diligence as well. I feel. But some of the friendship, like I, I give him one example. That's a great point. Um, but there was this particular client, ultra high net worth, um, that I work with. And of course, with these individuals, they're very cautious with who they interact with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because like I've just mentioned, everyone's always thinking about what can I get from him? Yeah, they're like, targets. How, how can I take take from him? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, okay, so what does this guy like? He likes watches. And I said to him, so what in particular? And believe it or not, he likes the Nautilus, right? Mm -hmm. Of course he would. <laughs> so I mean, like, okay. So I said to him, what are you looking for? And he said to me, I'm looking for a 5712. Mm -hmm. okay. So I took him into the store, which I'm very close with. We interacted. And I said, look, he's mm -hmm. a very, you know, he's a cool guy. He's a good friend. You know, we interact a lot about different topics, mainly about watches. He still didn't really, he still, you can sense that barrier. So even though we have these mm -hmm. interactions, you can always sense, like, you know, was he trying to get out of me, right? Mm hmm um then one day it was like nine months later he got a phone call from the store and says you know mr i won't say the name but your 5712 is in the store and let's not forget that's like a three to five year waiting list yeah so for the fact that he got in in uh, several months is actually quite rare mm -hmm. yeah it's so the, unheard of as, yeah, yeah it's rare uh so the fact and of course i'm talking about recent times where it's hit hot not when it was like 2017 yeah. when it was relatively flat um so as soon as he got that phone call he was really ecstatic you know, we met up, yeah. we had dinner together, we spent three hours talking really deeply. Yeah. So yes, you could say it's because of the materialistic thing of watches, but I think there was more to it than that. Yeah. There was this kind of like interaction of kind of, you know, I'm actually there using this thing as a way of bonding with you. And through that, we can actually get really talking about life and business. So if it's kind of, if that's what I have to do, so be it, I don't mind that. Um, before we go into the quick fires, I just think it's a shame if we don't... Act well, I want to ask on behalf of the listeners, if we don't ask him a question about the way he dresses. So people who can't see this, Alex dresses like a tramp, except <laughs> like a tramp, yeah, exceptionally really well. Like, a tramp. like he's always 10 out of 10, right, Dad? Tramp. He's no. 10 out of 10. Um, you could like notice proportions, him. everything. Yeah, you could notice yeah. him. He, for people who see people in suits a lot. Yeah. His his suits bang, bang yeah, it's on bang point, on, yeah. Right? And you you like I'm a guy, so I know something about yeah. suits, right? But you you're a, you're a girl, right? Yeah. So I'm truly fascinated by this. So I'm I'm thinking there's a lot of people who look at these magazines. They're like, okay, I match this with this, but how do you actually start? So do you look at yourself and you say, this is my body type, and then let me go and buy a pair of pants? But then where do I begin, right? So can you just roughly, in a nutshell, how do you dress as a guy? How do you like, what's the formula well, to build your wardrobe? Well, I'm flattered, too kind. Um, I keep it quite simple. So, no, thanks for your comments, but mm -hmm. I don't dress that well. There's better dresses out there than me. We just like, we just like, like, like a like, tramp. Like, 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 <laughs> this podcast isn't about me. No, no, I know no. I dress like amazing, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> um, well, essentially, if you, okay, I won't go into too much detail, but if you want to mm -hmm. begin, have essentials. So, if, for example, your blues, your navies, your whites. Those are the colors that you should go for. How about gray? Yes and no. Um, it has to be, depends on what kind of gray. Yeah. Also, please don't get too light stuff, like really light blue, light mm -hmm. gray. Mm -hmm. If it's for suiting, please don't. Um, and it's all about proportions. Mm -hmm. So like Lung Lung mentioned, a suit is actually like a disguise. Mm -hmm. It's kind of something that you can um, hide a lot of things about you. It's kind of, it's kind of you can, you can hide a lot of stuff. Yeah. So my belly. <laughs> no, but let's say, okay. So let's say you're relatively short. So the length of your jacket and the trousers, that has an impact. So having it cut proportionally to you kind, kind of has an impact. Um, if you're quite slim build, mm -hmm. having wider lapels kind of make you look a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. So for me, what I've come to realize is these little tweaks and differences here, just like that millimeter, mm -hmm. it's the same with watches. Those few millimeters actually play a massive difference with how the whole thing looks. And so what I normally do is keep things very simple and clean. Start off doing the essentials, your white, your navies, your dark blues. 
um, cut, fit, finding the right tailor for you. Mm -hmm. So really understanding about what is a good suit, like the length of your sleeve, um, the shoulders that you have, the, the lapel width, the length of your jacket. Once you get that all sorted, the rest becomes easy. I got a question because obviously I go with you, you know, to to find these things. Yeah, finally influence you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but for a lot of people out there, sure. they like to think, okay, first of all, is it if I spend more money, I'll definitely look better, number one. And two, where can I go even if I have the money? Like, yeah. Okay, so massive credits. I'm not going to do it. Are, are you doing plugins here? Do we get you might, Well, if you believe in them, you might as well just say <laughs> no, them. No, I will. So I'm a massive fan of like what the Armoury is doing. So good friends with Mark Cho, Sam over there. Um, the tailors that they have, for example, like Livrano, yeah, they're, they're like my favorite tailors on earth. They're just incredible. Um, so if you have the money, um, sometimes, unfortunately, yes. It's what are we talking about here? Suiting. Yeah, no, but yeah, price-wise. Price price-wise. Price-wise, they're talking about 60,000 Hong Kong and above. Okay. Um, so very affordable. 6,000 pounds, yeah. No biggie. <laughs> no biggie. That's a pair of but shoes like, for long. No, 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 not at all, not at all. But, but actually, the thing is, through them, because you like, I remember the first. I mean, um, this, I know there's a watch podcast, but I digress a little. Um, I remember when I reached that level when I went quite expensive. I was paying like twenty thousand Hong dollars for a suit. Mm -hmm. Then I remember trying a Livrano. It wasn't made for me. It was just like off the shelf, basically, mm -hmm. uh, someone else's jacket. Then I put it on and I thought, wow. Then I asked how much was the price, and he did say sixty thousand Hong Kong dollars. But when I looked at it, I kind of understood why. It was just kind of the portions. It was as good as a suit or as good as a thing that you ever want, basically. Um, so for a tailor-made, handmade thing, I thought it was kind of like a work of art. I thought, perfect. Mm. I, I kind of wow. get it now. But if you don't have the money, yeah. go f to your local... Let's l just do some research. I think every country has their respective tailors out there. Hong Kong, we certainly do. And there are certain ways that you can actually do it on the cheaper way mm -hmm. so there are good tailors out there for let's say ten thousand mm -hmm. yeah you won't get the same feel but because your knowledge of mm -hmm. understanding what makes a good suit then you can kind of apply those things to let's say a not as good master in making that suit and you can still mm -hmm. kind of get away a, with it i guess it is similar to watches and the fact that you have to spend a bit to learn yeah right yeah and you have so, to make some mistakes but right. like like i'll go back to my ip so this watch okay so in the grand scheme of things yes it is expensive but for I think the retail is what two nine two hundred ninety thousand Hong dollars or something well, you like that. Paid for I mean that. I can't remember. I mean someone along, someone along those lines. For two hundred ninety thousand Hong dollars, I need to look for a watch that's potentially a million for me to kind of get the same amount of pleasure. Mm -hmm. So it's not really about the amount of money that you spend, but it's kind of like, do you know what you're buying, hmm. and how much enjoyment do you think you can get out of it? Hmm. Okay, good. No. So let's go on to the final part of the podcast, just, which uh, is the quick fire. How many misses do I get? <laughs> none. <laughs> none, because you're my friend, so you get none. I get bullied, is it? Yeah. So are you a noodle guy or a rice guy? Can I say both? No, you can't no. say both. That's the whole point. <laughs> I like spaghetti as well, so noodles then. Okay. Have you ever bought a fake watch? No. Never ever? No. Okay. I have. Have you? Oh, well, why is that? Oh, yeah, that's new. You'd How have. come? Oh, yes. Is that to what? What for? I took it apart. Oh, mm -hmm. that's that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah I, I yeah, wanted yeah. to know what a watch is like inside, <laughs> right? So I bought a fake watch. <laughs> why don't you get a cheaper watch? Like because it's still a real watch. I mean, okay, anyway, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Italian or British tailoring? Italian. Okay. Why? I think the Italian tailors um, are just better fitting for Hong Kong. Just a little bit more, like bit casual bit more kind of bit more flair with british tailoring is very subtle which is not a bad thing but it, i think I, I can't even put it in a better way it's just kind of not my style it's not that way okay. not my fit right hong kong or london i like both you know um wow well, do you not get the point of this game no i don't like to pick <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, no but what, yeah. like for what for what purpose like to live all purposes what? no for, yeah. I, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. <laughs> Next. <laughs> okay, living. Living-wise, I think... Okay, for... Uh, again, for what... Okay, for convenience, Hong Kong. But for, like, enjoyment, London. Is that a better okay. way to say it? Yes. All right, yeah. Okay. Mahjong, Maja, or Chor 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 I don't have to play Mahjong, so Chor <laughs> easy, man. Okay, it's good that you don't know how to play Mahjong. Do you know how to play Mahjong? Yeah, man? I love it. All oh, right. Learn, man. No, yeah. I don't know how to play it. Okay. I it saves play Chor all the time. Saves, <laughs> from having to, saves me from having to fill in and sit there for hours, man. 
Right. Aston or Ferrari? I know Aston. the answer. Yeah. yeah easy Aston, yeah. man. Easy, easy. Why? It's just like Ferrari's... Okay. Is it because you're actually... You think you're Mr. James no, Bond? No, I don't think I'm Mr. <laughs> James Bond. No, but I think with Ferrari... Okay, so... It's kind of trying too hard. You know? Yeah. It's kind so of how like, would you say... What would watch equivalent be? With the Ferrari? Like, Ferrari. Oh, God. It's kind of like a blinged out diamond Rolex. So the rainbow... Yeah, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, Rainbow. That's yeah, yeah, perfect. yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, Lambo yeah, yeah, yeah. is like Richard Mill, and yeah, yeah, then Rainbow yeah. Rolex is Ferrari. Okay, Aston. Who's Aston then? It's more Philip DeFore. Yeah, it's more, it's more <laughs> subtle, isn't yeah, it? It's, it's and like also, the thing is, okay, understated. so frankly speaking, when you step out of Ferrari, that person thinks either, like, let's say you're relatively young, like our age, mm -hmm. they're like, okay, is that your mum's or dad's Actually, car? Actually, nobody knows how old like, you are. Yeah, I'm 30. Okay, yeah, I'm yeah. 30 now. So, um, when you look at your, yeah, when someone steps out of Ferrari, you think, okay, is that guy, like, what was it, mum's or dad's yeah, car? Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, what was this trying to, trying to be poser? Whereas Aston yeah. is like, okay, this person really had to pay attention to cars to kind of get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I used to get that because obviously I dress pretty thingy like, like, like a tramp. Yeah, <laughs> tramp. There's no, there's no, <laughs> long saying something here. There's yeah, no man. other way to put it but a tramp. So if I come out of a nice car, Every and I, I look young, right? And it's like he stole that car. Yeah, it's not even parents' cars. Did he steal that car? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Royal Oak or Nautilus? Royal Oak. Okay. Easy one. Hot pot or dim sum? Dim sum. Okay. How about you, then? <sighs> dim sum. Oh, really? Really? I thought you were a hot pot oh, person. Exactly. No, How do you down as a hot pot? Cha sa bao, cha sa su, and then liu sa bao. That alone, oh, wow! Like okay. What's your favorite dim sum place then? <laughs> You're full of bao. Yeah. Like, like, everything's bao, man. Gosh, it's like all bread. That's, that's you must tough. love carbs. Uh, she does love carbs. Oh, yeah, I can uh, what is it called? Long Long, Long Hing. 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 Yeah, oh, it has to be. Yeah, yeah. Long Hing Hing. I'm a uh, god. You know what? Right when I was in before I went to Shanghai, definitely a dim sum guy. Yeah. Now I'm in Shanghai. The hot pot guy, mate. Hot pot in China is like <laughs> another level, it mate. Yeah, no, it's man, another level, bro. Yeah. No, I did have one coconut hot pot and I really like. Actually, a hot pot for winter is brilliant. Yeah, yeah it can't yeah. be that. But yeah. hot pot for summer is a bit difficult, can't isn't that. it? Yeah. Oh, I love that beef going in, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ramen or yakitori? Ramen. Okay. You? Well, that interest? Uh, yakitori. Okay. Yeah. Tough, right. tough. That one's well, tough. But he loves noodles. Yeah. Yeah, true. GMT or Submariner? Neither. Uh, Next. Oh, <laughs> very firm. Yeah. Very firm. <laughs> Watches or cars? Oh man, as inspiration cars okay. um, for intricacies. Watches. Okay, good answer. I like that one. Ideal number of watches in a watch collection. <laughs> That's tough. Oh, that tough. About four to eight. Four to eight. Okay. Yeah. I thought you were going to be classy. Four to eight three. is a huge jump. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I mean, like, yeah. That's not cool. You no, can't yeah. no, because I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about like like the Casio Oaks, you know, that you have some beta uh, watches. All right. How okay. does that fit in? We're going to talk about this then. Okay. Eight, then. Four to eight. Right. Why four to eight? Okay. So depending on what kind of lifestyle I'm living. So now, of course, I'm suited and booted. So I would need some dress watches. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not saying that I would never be non-dressy but mm -hmm. i think it depends on your focus of your collection so mm -hmm. if i was to get leather watches of course i probably need more in rotation right so you probably need more time to kind of fluctuate but let's say i don't have let's say an attire to go towards i don't my lifestyle is not as crazy as what may think mm -hmm. so then i can have a bit less watches for example okay. so it does it does depend on your lifestyle all right okay next question the best restaurant in town in hong kong yeah hmm. That's tough, That's right? tough yeah. one. That's a really great question. Um, no? You start I thinking? Re I really can't even... Cause I always it's imagine, painful, isn't it, for yeah, you? Yeah, like if, if a friend comes to Hong Kong, where would I bring them? Yeah, the Thai place. Yeah, no, I, I tell you exactly. where. I tell but you I don't think that's the best. It's no. not the best, right? It's not the best My restaurant. favorite place, sorry, I know yeah. where I worded out, it's called Dot Cod. Oh, I know where it is. And you go down the stairs, that's it, right? That's it, that's it. That's a nice What do they sell? It's like seafood and like fish yeah. pie and like... How come like you guys have never taken me there? Because it's my secret spot. Because you dress like yeah. a trap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll be Do you think it's one of those dressy places? No, it's not. It's like the meal starts at like three hundred Hong dollars, which is actually very relative. Right, we have to go there. No, um, what I love about that place the most is the service. It's like, I mean, because I know the staffs there, mm -hmm. and they really do look after me. So every time I go there, I'm like, yeah. Is there any place that doesn't look after you? <laughs> Give me a second. Let me think. McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, if anybody wants to find Alex Lau, you can find him at Dr. Fern. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Dr. Fern's again is a great place for drinks. No, um, 
I have foxglove. Well, actually, no. I, I, I'm quite even actually like I go to Cafe de Coral, which is literally downstairs yeah. our office. The people that are really nice to me as well. So I'm like, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to work this yeah. out. No, I mean, but you two share a commonality. No, no, no. Like you make friends with people in Cafe de Coral, yeah. which is no problem at all. Yeah. And Lung makes people from Seven yeah, Eleven. Yeah, cool, man. Yeah, it's you like, got your best solid. bestie down there. It's you? like I think we've like growing up we had like very little friends or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like maybe. making up for it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be my friend? <laughs> yeah. Right. But I really want to try that place out. No, I'll take you there. Okay, last one. Boob or a butt guy? That's tough, man. Mm, I think... He's going to be like... Or face. Yeah, he's going to oh, be like face. face. Okay, oh, so we just face. put it back now. Boob or butt guy? <laughs> <laughs> like boob, maybe? Okay, all right then. Well, that concludes the Thank podcast. And I think it was, it, was yeah. real, it was a great pleasure for me to uh, interview you. I really, really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed listening back to it, Alex. Yeah. Um, And I hope the audience really enjoyed it. Wait, before we go, where can we find Alex? Um, My Instagram, which would sometimes change, is alexlau.ar. Just find me on Instagram. Nice. Yeah, so so, like we said, if you want to reach out to Alex or reach out to us, you can find me on Shanghai Watch Gang. You can find me on Long Long Thun or... Spell it, Thun. T-H-U-N. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Waiting List podcast has an Instagram page. Yeah, you can find us there. Yeah. It's been a real pleasure as well, guys. Thank you. Such an honor. You know, big fan of you two as well. <laughs> Number one fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get, get to the back of the queue. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we'll see you on the next one, guys. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you for tuning in to the Waiting List podcast. Hit the subscribe button and the next episode will come straight to your phone as soon as it's ready. Whilst I'm here, please remember to leave a nice review and follow us on Instagram at The Waiting List Podcast.